This is David Rawlings, founder of the London Longsword Academy and a sword master with over 25 years experience. Today he, and a very special guest, will be breaking down some of the weapons and combat styles from Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Whenever we're dealing with a machine gun hand, I always have several concerns. I would not want to shoot that thing again after I'd struck it against something solid. The other thing is, is it dangerous to wipe with? There may be some very slight spoilers ahead in terms of some unlocked weapons, but if you enjoy the video, make sure to let us know in the comments by hitting the like button and be sure to subscribe for more experts breaking down more of your favorite games. Without further ado, it's over to David. I think I got this. Then they're all yours. Copy that. So the first thing with Cloud Sword is it's basically a big Tanto design. In HEMA, we'd probably call this a saber because it's got one edge that's longer than the other. So the back of this is pretty much blunt, counts as a saber as far as we're concerned. Doesn't make much difference, except that there's not too much of a backswing on something like this, unless you just want to club someone with the flat side. There's a tendency within our community to try and make moves big and swirling when we're doing this, as you see with these swords. And there's practical applications that you can have with that in that if you want to try and keep opponents away from each other, it makes a lot of sense to have these moves that bring you between one and keep the other person separated from the other person, or maybe keep people moving away in different directions from you, pursuing into one direction, moving away from another opponent, then driving that opponent back and then swinging through. So sometimes with Cloud Sword, you see two opponents. It'd be nice to see the idea of either quarreling them into one direction or spreading them apart from each other. When we're dealing with a singular opponent, even if we're using a really, really big sword, there's not too much point in taking our sword in big wide swings that bring the sword behind us, because obviously that leaves the front completely open to the opponent and it might look good, but you're still in danger. So even with the really big swords, things like this, very, very similar in size to something like the Final Fantasy swords, there's still an idea of keeping the point on as much as possible in order to drive the opponent back when you're dealing with multiple opponents that changes slightly because obviously we want to either push them in one direction and keep them pinned in together so that we're only kind of fighting one body mass or we want to drive them apart away from us while pursuing one person and creating more space behind and around us in those cases you'll get more swirl but there's still an idea of driving singular opponents you keep the point as focused on the opponent as possible you do see parallels to this kind of sword. Not so much this, oddly enough. This obviously is a really, really big sword, but in Austria, there is a really huge Kriegmesser. It probably stands about this big, and that is a big single-edged sword. Now, again, there are things that you would do with this that you wouldn't do with a Kriegmesser because a Kriegmesser is gonna have one blunt back edge to it, very, very similar to Cloud Sword. But with this kind of sword, you'd more use the back, back edge sometimes to clear. This, when you're making wide sweeping motions, is actually more effective than kind of turning your hands up like so. This weakens your body structure, whereas this moves back into a position where effectively you're using your back muscles to reinforce the strike. Not so much use with something that doesn't have that sharp back edge to it. And when I say back edge, it basically means that this is the edge that you usually present towards the opponent, just like you're cutting a loaf of bread, something like that. And then the other edge is the edge that actually presents towards the top of your arm. So when we're talking about weights in swords, it's often very, very misleading. The construction of the sword, the way that metal is removed from the blade, the way that more mass of metal is held towards the hilt, the weight of the pommel, the way the blade is shaped can make a lot of difference to how something balances. And very often how you actually look at it when you see it in a museum or when you see it in a game isn't actually how it handles in real life. You may look at a sword like Cloudbuster or any of the swords in Final Fantasy and go, there's no way that they'd have that kind of presence, but you don't really know about the construction of them. It looks incredibly unwieldy. I would say that if you actually held it in your hand, it would probably be unwieldy. It doesn't look like it's balanced well, but having picked up lots of historical models that you think are going to be insanely heavy, or contrary to that, you think are going to be really, really well balanced, they very often perform in exactly the opposite way to the way you expect. I always think when you're playing computer games, you need to be able to suspend your disbelief and take away your bias. It's the idea of sort of like these swords are effectively the dragon. We don't have to have reality, we have to have enjoyment. And yes, when we're looking at these, you're not actually cutting pieces off the monsters even generally, you're clubbing them. So you're kind of bouncing off them and having little sparks and this kind of thing. None of those features are things that you really expect in a sword. You want the sword to cut through them, hence having edges, get over it and enjoy the game. 
The idea of blocking something with the flat of your sword is very much something that happens within fencing, but not to the exclusion of other techniques. So very often we'll block with either the edge of the sword, which effectively will be like a counter cut. Sometimes we'll block with the half edge, which is kind of halfway between the flat and the edge. Little differences according to different authors on how you might want to block a sword. It is very much a, a meme within the community where we have this, oh, you block with the flat of our strong. And there's one particular sword instructor who carried it with them for a very long time. And I stood with them in a museum where they went, look, look, look at the damage on all these. These reinforce my idea of the, the flat of my strong being used to block. While there is edge damage all along the sword, different parts of the sword are used to block. We shouldn't obsess about it being one particular part everything has a use. The idea of having something which is broad that you can put in front of you and that you can move around. Certainly this is incorporated into different styles of sword play. You could say Cavendish, for example, presents the flat towards the opponent, usually in a more vertical format, and he will quite generally move around the sword in this way to keep the sword as a shield between you and the opponent. So absolutely it does happen. It shouldn't be regarded as something that's right to the exclusion of anything else. I gotta say, that one felt pretty good. So the Igneous Sabre, they have at least called it a sabre, which is the right thing because again, it has edges of different lengths. So this is really important. And the idea that a sabre would not necessarily have a sharp back edge, not wrong. When you have swords that are incredibly ornate, we have a tendency to look at them as being more fantasy swords. And I very much recommend that you go to a museum because yes, there are swords that follow these very, very martial practical looks but something can be incredibly ornate if you have the money to have it and it can still be a martially efficient weapon because it's still got a freaking great sharp thing on the end of it so don't get too hung up on the idea that you can't have something ornate and beautiful or fantasy looking and it's still not still be something that's not effective it can be effective obviously it being volcanic has the implication that it might be something that's made of glass or rock. We have the idea that obviously things that are made out of obsidian can be very, very sharp. And the, the thing that's always said is that they can be sharper than surgical tools. I do not know. I have never compared them. You take one, I'll take the other. The Masamune, again, a very, very big sword. Masamuni being a reference to Japan's most revered swordsmith. It looks lighter, but again, that doesn't necessarily translate into being better balanced, but the way it's been portrayed shows it being a much more nimble sword than the others. There's a lot less heft to it, a lot more subtlety. So there's the distinguishing characteristic to it. Now that holds true of many swords, the way you use them. Sometimes I put different hilts on some of my swords to change the balance. Sometimes I put different blades in them to change the balance so that I can feel how that changes how I play. So you have to compensate for different features within the sword. It looks like it's being used nimbly. It looks to be a more light sword. Great looking sword. Having long hair is no reflection of your martial prowess. There are examples historically when having long hair has been a really, really bad thing. Daniel Mendoza was actually held up by his hair and pugilized by, I believe, Gentleman Jim. There used to be a rule that if you went down to your knee, the fight would stop. Gentleman Jim held him up by the hair and repeatedly punched him in the face. Having long hair can be a hindrance, but not necessarily a sign of anything you should worry about when you're using a sword, unless it's getting in your face or you try and inhale it. <laughs> So I get asked an awful lot what my favorite type of sword is, whether it's in computer games, whether it's in real life. And my most simple answer is, why would you not want to have all of them? Why would you not want to experience the difference between all the different types of weight and balance and see how that informs you? Because that experience of experimenting is great. So rather than worrying about whether it's a Japanese and Indo-Persian or whatever kind of sword, think about what the capabilities of the blade are. So the blade profile, the length, the shape of it, whether it has edges. Some swords don't have edges, some do. Some swords have a very limited point. All of those dictate how the sword is going to be used, much less than any form of nationality or any artificial boundary. So the four-point shuriken, I like the idea that you have really hench ninjas trying to carry a bunch of these things around and just sort of like not make a noise with these enormous clubs that they're carrying. So when you're dealing with any kind of weapon that has multiple points, obviously the more things you have pointing towards you and extending towards you and away from the enemy, 
the more limited you are in how you can bring it towards yourself practically. I really dislike the idea of something with a spike on the pommel. It's a really nice trope that people like to have in films. Oh, we have a dagger on the end of my pommel. Well, have a dagger in the other hand be much more simple or turn your sword around much more simple things. So that's my only wariness about this as a weapon is the ability to injure yourself becomes a little bit better. But again, like having teeth, you get used to using them. The idea of rotating something in your hand in order to attack it is probably not the, you must have wrists of absolute, absolute steel to be able to sort of like grind the thing like this. But again, it's a fantasy weapon, so it doesn't matter. Turning the sword in your grip or turning a weapon in your grip totally a thing that happens inverting the edges changing how you do it Tebow has a grip which usually lines the blade from left to right but then you rotate it so that you get a better presentation of the edge towards your second knuckles so that you can make more clear natural cuts so yes there's rotation having something spinning in your hand not entirely sure and again I would feel very very wary of those points spinning near me so the design of this particular staff weapon really amused me because pretty much everyone I know has gone and wanted to start training to get a little bit stronger, to be better at star fighting, to be better at sword fighting, and has immediately gone into the gym and gone, that barbell looks helpful and picked up the bar and no, they are not good for fighting with. They're incredibly heavy, very, very ill-balanced. You can't spin them very much. However, it's a really, really good thing in any staff weapon to be able to cast magic missile. Really, really useful, even as the odds an awful lot. So when we're really dealing with the staff as a weapon, again, there's an awful lot of variety in the technique and that usually depends on the length of the weapon. So short staff, there'll be a lot of reversing the staff, changing which end you're using, rotating the end in order to use it. And then the half staff, the thing that you're more familiar with with fantasy tropes where you're holding it in the middle, that's a half star. Grips change within it. You can use it more like a spear and it's used as a training tool for the spear because you're using to thrust and you're keeping the opponent at a distance. You're maintaining space. There's a lot more correlation between staff weapons and sword weapons than you might think. And also between spear weapons. Obviously, anything that's a pole arm is effectively whatever that thing is on a stick. Now, we might also use it in similar ways to how we use these big swords and a lot of the way that we understood the use of the large sword, the Montantes and things like this, was actually quite influenced originally by things like Jogo de Pau, which are these stick fighting systems, which again are teaching you to fight very often against multiple opponents. It might have made our technique a little bit too swirly and less sword-like because we're dealing with something that can operate on that inertia. Obviously, we know that the staff is a more intellectual weapon because Donatello uses it. So the punchy gloves. Punchy gloves are great if your opponent doesn't have anything better than punchy gloves. If you could have something better than punchy gloves, buy better than punchy gloves TM. Punchy gloves great if your opponent has something less effective than you. And the rule is, is if you have something that's better than a naked hand, have that thing that's better than the naked hand. Obviously, if you have things, bits of metal or weighted things in your gloves, obviously that's going to impact in how you can hit them. Effectively, you're turning your hand into a sap. It has its uses, but again, if I had the choice between having them and a sword and I wanted to stay alive, unless I was in very, very close proximity and the other person didn't have a sword, I wouldn't want it. There is certainly examples of having armoured gloves, actually just having a gauntlet for your left hand, having something which is more protective even. So one, from the point of view of taking less damage to your hand, our skin is very, very prone to being cut. Having something with even just better hide on it is better for being able to grapple other people's blades, for example. Being able to, if you've closed with somebody, hit them with something harder than your hand, also very, very good. So as a supplementary weapon, yep, great. Obviously, in fights where two people are armed with the same ability to punch each other liberally, then yeah, they have some usage. The idea of an armoured glove is something that is used as an addition to your sword. The poor person version of having an armoured glove is you have a piece of wood on your arm so that you can just have that up your sleeve and you can just use it to block the sword. Yes, absolutely having an armoured glove, just an armoured glove, not necessarily a full suit of armour or anything like that, just something that you can actually block a sword with or impede the motion of the sword somewhat at some point much, much safer than just using your naked hand. So yep, absolutely is listed as being a martial tool in addition and as a companion to the sword. So the Tiger Fangs or the Wolverine Origins, as we like to call them, 
are an interesting weapon because they seem to be a combination of both punch and draw. So very, very often within daggers and this kind of thing, you have a more singular design, not, not completely singular, but something which is more orientated towards the punching mechanic or the alignment of the natural fist, or you have something which is more aligned to the slap. So this is an interesting combination of the two things. There's a problem with all weapons getting stuck with people, and the longer it is, the more likely it is to get stuck. The shorter it is, probably the less likely it is to get stuck, unless it has fush hooks on it. It's gonna be terrible for picking your nose. Whenever we're dealing with a machine gun hand, I always have several concerns. First of all is never really try and hit anyone with it. Unless you're really sure of its structural integrity, I would not want to shoot that thing again after I'd struck it against something solid. The other thing is, is it dangerous to wipe with? So I think we spoke about in our previous video the idea of having sort of like a companion weapon of a gun. And this is really it, except that you're much less likely to get disarmed. And yeah, I, if, if I was going to have a companion weapon to this, I don't know, maybe I'd have a sword in the other hand. I like the idea that rather than hitting someone with the gun barrels, that maybe I would have something like a cleaver, like a bayonet, something that I could use that would not damage the ability of the gun to fire. Things I really do like about this weapon is, from a Verdadera Destreza perspective, the the idea that the sword kind of like extrudes itself through the middle of your wrist. I do wonder if it would make it more natural to aim from a body position rather than a sort of like an eyesight position. Would it be more natural in that premise? I think it's a really, really interesting weapon. It's a fun character I've always enjoyed. So yeah, it's one of those things. Don't hit people with it. Let it cool down before you wipe. Be sensible, folks. So collars and fighting, I think collars mostly should be there to protect you from incidental damage in fencing. That particular area is, is very, 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 very important to keep safe. So I think the dog has really taken this to heart. It always makes me think of Battle Cat and I have real issues with Battle Cat because you have, I think, something that is mind control. So I worry here that you have someone who is naturally inherently afraid of fighting who then is forced to wear a collar that encourages them to fight and gives them a full sense of bravado. <laughs> Easy, Cringer. It's me, Adam. And we should be thinking of Battle Cat. I think the idea, if you are so naturally well-armed, that the only incentive that you can have is a little bit of bling to fight better. I'm all for it. You know, get yourself a bit of earring, get a little bit of a pearl, get yourself a necklace, look a little bit gaudy, get in there and fight a bit. As the next party member is a warrior of a very feline nature, David decided to bring in a little extra help. So this is actually possibly my favourite character and it's not the cat that's my favourite character. Oh, I'm sorry. You are my favourite character. Hello. Like I say, very temperamental about being picked up. So my favorite thing about Kate Sith is actually the mount. I think the mount has got the best fighting style. I just like the idea of just running towards things and just buffeting them with your wrists. I think it's just a really fun character and it's been a stalwart and I really, really love it. It's cutesy, it's, it's fun. This one's a showstopper. One more shot. I really, really enjoy the Final Fantasy series. I've played the MMORPG, I think, with a few missteps, it's generally been a really, really wonderful thing. Obviously, Final Fantasy VII was the best, so it's nice to see this getting the attention again. I think the important thing to think about with any kind of weaponry is that throughout history, all over the world, people make different kinds of weapons because they want to see how they work. Sometimes they make them not to work, but to be visually impressive. And all of those factor into things. So just play the game and enjoy it. Just try a different sword and enjoy it. Try a different weapon and enjoy it. And yeah, just enjoy the fantasy. Doesn't matter. Thank you so much for watching and another thanks to David and Bruce for joining us on this episode. Remember to comment below what other games you'd like to see on the show and be sure to subscribe for more content like this and beyond. And action! Some know me as the world's greatest materia hunter. Others, an unstoppable assassin. And the rest, a benevolent and beautiful ninja! But, who am I?